Disclaimer. This story is based on alleged accounts without concrete evidence and may be viewed as science fiction. It is presented for entertainment and discussion purposes only, and we do not endorse or support any claims made. Viewers should conduct their own research and form their own opinions. The interviewee, referred to as Colonel X, claimed to have worked at the Dulce facility from 1979 to 1983. He revealed a large amount of classified information about the facility, most of which differs greatly from the information currently circulating online. This interview transcript is excerpted from the secret interview chapter of Anthony F. Sanchez's book, UFO Highway. The interview covers the basic situation of the Dulce facility, the history of the indigenous people in the facility, and the origin of human history, providing some enlightenment. For UFO enthusiasts to understand the current situation of extraterrestrial civilizations, this interview took place on January 6, 2010, in a private residence in Placer County, California, USA. The interviewer is Anthony F. Sanchez, a UFO researcher with a PhD in computer information systems. He worked as a software engineer for companies such as 3Com, Intel, Acer, and Netscape for 16 years. Since 2000, he has been researching the mystery of human origins, including Hebrew religious texts, Dead Sea Scrolls, Sumerian Babylonian inscriptions, and believes that extraterrestrials were important participants in early human history. The interviewee is a former colonel who claimed to have served in the U.S. Air Force. He was deployed to the Dulce facility as a member of a special medical team. And this interview transcript is based on what he saw and heard in the facility, as well as some information he investigated privately after leaving the facility. Prior to this interview, Anthony conducted two lie detector tests on Colonel X under the guise of a psychiatric evaluation. And the results indicated that he was mentally sound. At the request of the colonel, no personal information about him will be disclosed in the interview transcript. But he vouched for the authenticity of all his experiences with his personal integrity. Hello, Colonel. First, I would like to ask about your current situation. What kind of work are you doing, and are you still serving in the military? No. I retired from the Air Force and returned to the university campus, where I obtained two master's degrees in psychology. Currently, I am a teacher at a university, and I have a happy family with three grown-up children. Okay. Can you talk about your military experience? and how you came into contact with the Dulce facility. In the latter part of my military career, when I was still a USAF major, I had always dreamed of being promoted to colonel. To achieve this goal, I worked hard and took my job seriously. At the time, I was stationed at McClellan Air Force Base near Sacramento, California providing psychiatric medical services to the U.S. Air Force and occasionally the CIA. One day, I received orders from Edwards Air Force Base to go to a secret facility in Dulce, New Mexico, for a confidential mission. Before this, I had never heard of Dulce, and neither had my colleagues. The orders from Edwards were clear that this was a top-secret mission. And I had to sign relevant confidentiality agreements. This was not my first time participating in a top-secret mission. A year before, I had been sent to Fort Irwin in Southern California. 
to participate in a crash site recovery operation. A USC 130E transport plane crashed there, and survivors claimed that they had a close encounter with an unidentified flying object traveling at a speed of about 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers per hour in the air after a deafening high pitched sound. The plane's engines failed, and it crashed, killing two pilots. My job was to conduct initial physical and psychological evaluations of the surviving personnel from the plane crash. After the interviews, our team would provide a report to assess whether these individuals were still fit for military service. The survivors of the Fort Irwin crash were evaluated as mentally unstable. And while I couldn't confirm what he saw, his mental state was undoubtedly severely traumatized and eventually required hospitalization. I know you're more interested in Dulce, but what I want to say is that my experience in this job led me to connect with Dulce. You mean your work in Dulce wasn't just a coincidence? Yes, precisely because of the Fort Irwin mission. The Air Force leadership believed that I was psychologically prepared for certain areas, although I wasn't. I don't know who recommended me to the higher ups. But two highly rated colleagues were also called in. Usually, we work in teams of four to six people, but this time there were only three of us. And later one more person was added, but that person was not in our professional field. When I first arrived at the Dulce facility, I was surprised to find that its design was similar to that of the Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station, which I had previously visited. But the entrance to the Dulce facility was only half the size of an Air Force base. The design of this level of concealment was excellent. If you fly over the Dulce facility in an airplane, you can't observe the entrance with the naked eye. Only when you land on an inconspicuous landing pad can you discover it. This design, which uses the desert landscape to conceal the facility, is very clever, and without coordinates, no one can find it. Colonel, I apologize for interrupting you, but I am interested in your work at Cheyenne Mountain. Could you describe it for me? Sure, before I went to Cheyenne Mountain. I had already obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology. At that time, I had always wanted to take the time to obtain a degree in psychiatry. But our training was tough, and I had no energy to focus on my studies. To achieve my goal, I began to actively volunteer for medical missions within the military, where we would conduct psychological evaluations of military personnel, usually after they had experienced certain events. These events were usually classified, like the Fort Irwin crash I mentioned earlier. In addition, there were places like Cheyenne Mountain where we needed to evaluate military personnel who had been in deep isolation for extended periods. The Cheyenne Mountain Base is located 600 meters deep in the mountains and is home to many people. However, only those who are rated as top-notch or have certain specialized expertise need to undergo our evaluation. This situation is not severe, though. There are about 1,500 people on the base. And only the 3rd to the 5th of May suffer from mild claustrophobia. However, if they are found to have high levels of claustrophobia or taphophobia, 
they will be reassigned to other positions. What is taphophobia? It's the fear of being buried alive, and it's not uncommon in these military bases. Once such a problem is discovered, the base won't waste time trying to correct or treat it, but will directly reassign the personnel. This is the practice of most military bases, except for the Dulce facility. What makes Dulce different? Because the people who work at Dulce are not randomly assigned and cannot be changed at will. They need to undergo strict background checks and psychological assessments. Could you please talk about your mission? Sure. It was probably late November 1979. And I was waiting for the next mission order at McClellan. There are over 100 military bases within the United States. And my team always has plenty of work to do. For some confidential missions, the CIA is always involved. Making these assignments joint tasks between the military and the CIA. However, this time, the document that came over had the official seal of Top Secret, Psi, USAF, DOE restricted content, with an embossed DOE marking. This was the first time for me because it was always the CIA before. And I had never had any dealings with the U.S. Department of Energy. At that time, I didn't even know what the Department of Energy was doing. Later, I found out that it was established in 1977. And was responsible for overseeing nuclear weapons. Naval nuclear reactors and nuclear energy development programs. Before I could finish reading the order, headquarters called me and ordered me to report to Edwards immediately. An HC-130 was already waiting for me on the base's tarmac. I felt that something urgent must have happened and quickly grabbed my backpack and rushed out. The plane arrived in about an hour. At Edwards, I met a few colleagues I knew before. But only one other person received the same order as me. He was also a major, and we had participated in some confidential event investigations together before. Our order was to remain silent and wait for the guidance of a mentioned brigadier general in the report. Which was also strange because our team leaders were generally only colonels. There were three of us in our team, all majors, including myself. And the acquaintance I knew, as well as a navy major. I was always curious about the identity of that brigadier general and suspected that he was in charge of Edwards. Colonel, could you talk about those colleagues or the Brigadier General? No. I have no intention of disclosing any privacy information that could potentially harm others. The only information I can tell you is our ranks the time and place of the event, and all the information. That can help you understand the event, but I won't reveal any personal privacy. Well then, let me rephrase my question. Without involving any privacy, could you tell me if they are still alive? Sure. The Brigadier General has passed away. The Air Force Major I know is still living at home. And the Navy Major is doing well, living in Florida. By the way, after the Dulce incident, 
my role in the military was different from theirs. Understood. Please continue talking about Dulce. I want to reiterate that before this mission, I had never heard of Dulce. I had traveled with my family to the desert in northern New Mexico before. But I had never been there on official business. Nor had I heard of any military presence there. When I saw the name Dulce facility on the report, my first reaction was that it was an airport, military base, or some kind of secretive military research institute. The Brigadier General then revealed to us some basic information. That the Dulce facility was a secret complex consisting of two parts located near the town of Dulce, New Mexico. The complex was similar to the Cheyenne Mountain complex. But the construction was completely different. The military command system inside was also unique, with high levels of authority. However, when I first arrived at Dulce, I was surprised by the sign, which read, Welcome to the Rio Ariba Scientific and Technological Underground Auxiliary. Wow! Is that the official name of Dulce facility? Yes, the public is not aware of this. And I have not seen this name exposed in the media or on the internet. People inside the facility simply call it Rio Ariba or Dulce facility. If you've ever dealt with publicly available documents from the U.S. military, you may have seen this name. But it's usually marked as Rio Ariba, Colorado, or Rio Ox. One little known detail is that the Dulce facility consists of two parts, and a third part was later built. Sure, I can tell you about the first two parts. They are called D1 and D2. D1 is the largest facility located directly beneath the Archuleta Mesa. And D2 is a smaller two-story facility located several miles underground. To the east of the Archuleta Plateau. D1 is the main research facility. Where all the clerks and scientists work, while D2 is for security personnel. It has a helicopter landing pad with a hydraulic lift system that allows helicopters to quickly descend into the underground facility. Below the landing pad is an empty space used to park high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, HMMWVs. What are HMMWVs used for in an underground base? Can you drive them around down there? They are located on the lower level which has a platform connecting the D1 and D2 areas. The HMMWVs can be driven around the desert area near Dulce, but they are typically only used within the base. What I observed was that the helicopters would deliver supplies to the D2 landing pad, then descend into the underground area, where the HMMWVs would load up the supplies and transport them to D1. In addition to this method, many supplies were also shipped to D1 from Los Alamos or other locations. When I was there in 1982, there was a need to switch out two M998 trucks for a new model. The new trucks were first transported to the Colorado border on County Road 357, then driven to D2. Once at D2, they were quickly sent underground. The entrance and exit to D1 was rarely used, and most visitors accessed the facility via shuttle buses. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will resume our discussion on the Dulce files.